Right, so I'm here to talk about the role of the psychologist in public mental health. Um, and I think, first of all, to say that when we speak about a psychologist, you need to think in two ways. We play two roles. One is to assess a situation or a diagnosis or an issue. The other is to treat it. In other words, being a clinician versus a therapist. And I'll sort of highlight those as we start on the outside and work our way into the hospital. I think the first port of call for public when they're seeing a psychologist is in the clinic setup. We have a number of outpatient clinics. Uh, most of these clinics have psychologists at least once a week. And the public with problems either with themselves, their relationships, their children's traumas would initially go to that clinic as a first port of call. They would then be assessed um, by a psychologist and if it's deemed that therapy is needed and um, therapy is provided at that particular clinic, because not all clinics have therapy, um, the therapy will happen there or they'll get referred here, which I'll talk about just now. So in other words, a psychologist would play a assessor and therapist role in most of these outpatient clinics and so we try to manage as many of these problems on an outpatient clinic basis as possible. When would that change? I think that would change in two situations. Let's first of all talk about voluntary. Um, it's completely possible to be admitted to this hospital as a voluntary Section 25 patient. You would come into one of our open therapy wards and called Ward A Neuro and in that ward the psychologist would see the public once again as somebody who assesses the problem and treats the problem and the idea is to get this person um, back on their feet so that they can then continue their treatment at home as an outpatient. Another aspect I guess would be the SAR2 substance abuse treatment program. Um, all addiction treatment happens within this hospital and so they will be referred from the clinic to us and a therapist would once again, a psychologist there, would be an assessor and a therapist. And the last voluntary would be outpatient therapy department. Um, you don't have to be an inpatient here at this hospital to see a therapist. We have an outpatient team who see clients in the afternoon once again, initially assessing the situation and then providing either short-term or long-term therapy. And it's based on what you can pay. Um, and most people who do not earn an income well, all people that don't earn an income and so on uh, do not pay for these services. Um, we've got about a one month waiting list in general, so uh, the turnaround is pretty good. But out there, there isn't just the voluntary problems, there are the involuntary problems, and that is when somebody is psychotic. Um, and in a situation like that, the psychologist would arrange for a transfer to Settlers Hospital for a 72 hour observation. Uh, and if after that 72 hour observation at Settlers it is deemed that the person is indeed certifiable under Section 32, that person will then get referred through to us. And a psychologist's role in those acute lockup wards is not on treatment, it's on assessment. And uh, treatment at that point is usually pharmaceutically based and as soon as the person is stable and apsychotic, they will get referred through to the therapy wards where we would then provide therapy and then again link them up to the outpatient services. I think the most important change is we're no longer admitting any Section 25 voluntary patients into our system. Um, at the moment, the only way that you get into Fort Ingham Hospital is through the 72-hour system to be involuntary admitted into one of our acute wards. And even so, you will not be transferred to our acute wards. You'll be transferred to our own two-week quarantine facility within the hospital. Essentially, we double-check everything. Uh, we have a massive patient content here at the hospital and our job is to protect them and so all voluntary patient work is deemed um, able to be managed on an outpatient basis. So that includes uh, SAR2 rehabilitation facility as well. So in other words at the moment there is no inpatient therapy happening at this hospital unless uh, we are talking about a forensic inpatient who's already somebody within our hospital and we provide that therapy on a whenever needed basis. So that's the first major change. The second major change I think is um, what we wear. As you can see I'm wearing a mask um, in a situation like this. 
we, we have particular requirements and if we're going into quarantine wards where we're in full PPE with visors, if we're in meetings uh, with staff members, we're wearing visors and 95s and so there's a, bit, uh, a number of things that we're supposed to wear or not wear depending on where we are. Um, the next is the change to our outpatient therapy services. Um, initially, for the first couple of weeks when quarantine began, uh, there were no outpatient therapy services unless there was uh, a risk that was worrying. Um, and we kept an eye on these patients telephonically. But with quarantine going on as long as it has, we've had to become creative and so for those who have Zoom facilities we're providing therapy using Zoom, for those who do not have Zoom facilities we're providing therapy telephonically and we're contacting the client and setting up weekly sessions as is normal so that it's not an expense to them. Um, it's been hard, it's been foreign um, but it's been more helpful and a bit easier than we all thought it would be. Um, there are positives and negatives to doing telephone therapy and not seeing the person that you're talking to and um, so in that way it's, it's been hard but the anonymity uh, has helped um, on some level. Um, harder things talked about sooner um, so it hasn't been a negative um, and so at the moment we don't have a waiting list. Um, everybody that's been on our waiting list is currently being seen um, and so that's the thing, you know, not doing face-to-face -face therapy for the first time in 20 years for many of us has been a very, very hard thing. Um, but we're okay. In terms of well, what's happening in therapy itself, has the therapy focus changed? I mean, we basically got three different groups of people coming in here at the moment in terms of needing therapy. The one would be the person that's coming for the kinds of problems that they've always come in for whether it's uh, um, an individual process, a couple process, or whatever. Um, so that's happening. But a second group of people are also coming in, and that is people with problems, original kind of issue issues, but um, there are also COVID-related concerns that are sprinkled into the therapy, or therapy starts off COVID-related and moves into something else, or covert consequences or concerns or aggravating uh, issues that were there before the virus outbreak and so it's a combination of and then lastly of course there's all the covert focus you know we've played quite a strong psychoeducational role on our websites and through talks on the radios and through appointments with particular people needing to be psychoeducated um, but then there's a lot of support needed, you know, the consequences in terms of job loss, bereavement, anxiety, increased panic attacks, and just a general increased level of anxiety and concern in this foreign time. Um, and so there's a lot of covert specific focus happening as well. And so uh, we are basically just trying to figure out which category this person is coming in for and then focusing on that. Obviously the covert psychoeducational stuff is uh, something that can be done quicker versus the therapy stuff that was determined on I guess the presenting issue and so we're still doing short term therapy or long term therapy and we're hoping that the therapies that are starting off telephonically or Zoom now will evolve back into face to face therapies when all of this ends.